Hello everyone. Thanks for joining me for this webinar about nutritional support for migraine. I'm Andrea Bartels. I'm a registered nutritional therapist and I'm the lead educator for Pure Lab Vitamins. In this webinar, some of the questions I'm going to answer include, what's the difference between migraine and attention headache? What symptoms are associated with migraine? What are the risk factors? What are some common migraine triggers? Which nutritional strategies might help those who get migraines? If you suffered from the pain and inconvenience of a migraine, I'm glad you're here. I also welcome those who haven't had a migraine. My hope is that the information I share here will help you understand and support someone who does suffer from this condition, a friend, a colleague, or a family member. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box available on your Zoom screen's menu bar. Afterwards, I'll be joined by Cyrus, our founder and formulator. Together, we'll answer your questions related to migraine. So what exactly is migraine? Is it just a really bad headache? Although the headache of a migraine is its most well-known feature, it's not usually the only symptom. There are other symptoms that set it apart from an ordinary tension headache. I'll talk about those shortly. Migraine is a medical condition that's classified as a neurological disorder. It's typically characterized by what's called a vascular headache, occurring when one or more of the brain's major blood vessels dilate, causing pain. The most common symptoms can include throbbing pain on one side of the head, sensitivity to noise, light, smells, etc., nausea, vomiting, and sometimes an aura, which I'll explain shortly. It's these things, the incapacitating pain, the add-ons of sensory changes, the nausea and the aura that may occur are what makes a migraine much more complex than a tension headache. Whereas a tension headache is typically well managed by over-the-counter pain medications like NSAIDs or acetaminophen, these medications don't usually make much of a dent in the symptoms of migraine. A migraine typically involves four stages. Be aware that not everyone experiences all four stages and they may last for shorter or longer periods than what I'm going to describe. The first stage is called the prodromal stage. This is the period of time before the pain starts and typically starts a few hours or up to two days in advance of the pain. What you might notice during the stage are changes in your body's daily routine. For example, you might feel constipated or need to urinate more often. You may have trouble sleeping, so you feel more tired. You may experience mood changes or food cravings. Some people even develop a stiff neck. If you're new to migraine, then you may not be aware that these are warning signs that can lead up to an attack. The second stage of a migraine attack is one that isn't always present. That is, you might skip right over it. It's the one that only about 30% of migraine sufferers experience. It's known as the aura stage. An aura is characterized by temporary visual disturbance or vision loss. It creates distortion in what a person's looking at. For example, words they're reading may appear to jiggle on the page or the screen. Some images may appear to flash on and off, or even be absent from the visual field. But an aura can even manifest as numbness, a pins and needles sensation, or difficulty speaking. No matter which symptoms, an aura tends to last anywhere from 5 to 60 minutes. The headache phase comes next. It most often lasts four to hours to three days in length. Most migraine sufferers describe it starting with one-sided head pain that may shift or spread to the other side of the head as well. It's a throbbing or pulsating pain that can persist for hours or days. But that's not all. When you have a migraine, everything smells stronger, looks brighter, and sounds louder because of the sensitization of the trigeminal nerve. Essentially, normal inputs of stimuli overwhelm a migrainer in the midst of an attack, making them very irritable. Ask them what you can do to help and they will probably tell you to leave them alone. I wanted to share how medical researcher David Dodick from the Mayo Clinic describes this sensitivity to those who haven't had a migraine. He says, a migrainer's brain is like a car with a heightened alarm system that goes off simply because you walked close to it. During the attack phase of migraine, there may also be gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting. 
I'm sure you can appreciate that makes it even more tiring and debilitating. Thankfully, all of these symptoms subside as you enter the fourth stage, the post-drome phase. The headache and other symptoms have dissipated, but the individual feels tired and drained. They may experience brain fog, an inability to concentrate and complete simple tasks. This recovery phase can last up to two days. So you can see that this is a very debilitating condition, especially in individuals who experience this several times per month. Imagine someone with chronic migraine experiences at least 15 headache days per month. Not only are 90% of migraine sufferers unable to work or function normally during an attack, the post phase can delay their ability to get back to normal. What's going on inside the body during a migraine attack? There are several theories that have tried to explain how it happens. I'm going to stick to the ones for which some of the treatments are devised to tackle. First, a mental, emotional, physical, or chemical stressor activates the release of certain neuropeptides from the trigeminal nerve cells. The trigeminal nerve is the largest and most complex of our 12 cranial nerves. It's able to relay sensations of pain and touch from the face, the head, and the jaw to a center inside the brainstem via a neuropeptide called CGRP. That's calcitonin gene-related peptide. When CGRP is released by the trigeminal neurons, it sensitizes the nerves in these areas as well as those that reside next to the network of blood vessels surrounding the brain, producing pain signals. What's interesting is that some scientists believe that migraineurs are more sensitive to CGRP or that they make more of it than non-migraineurs. But there's more to it. Migraine episodes seem to be preceded by the stacking of blood platelets, the clotting cells within the blood. This platelet aggregation stimulates the release of serotonin. Now, despite the reputation of serotonin as a feel-good neurotransmitter, it's a vasoconstrictor. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, but in the case of migraine, this increase of serotonin leads to the tightening of the cerebral blood vessels. This leads to reduced blood flow to the brain. Besides producing pain, CGRP also acts as a powerful vasodilator of cerebral blood vessels. So now we have vasodilation. This increases cerebral blood flow, which by itself may sound okay but it's accompanied by a kind of inflammatory response that results in irritation of the trigeminal nerve. This is important to understand because it's this nerve that transmits the pain signal to the other parts of the brain, leading to the sensation of headache. This explains why some of the drugs prescribed to treat migraine are vasoconstricting drugs. But these drugs don't always work, nor are they safe for everyone. For instance, a patient with cardiovascular disease may not be a good candidate for a vasoconstricting drug. Current drug treatments include preventive and acute therapies, but they usually provide incomplete relief and come with side effects such as sedation, rebound headaches, or risk of addiction. There are now drugs that work by blocking CGRP by parking in its receptor. I'm sure Cyrus will have more to say about these medications from a pharmacist's point of view, so I'll leave it at that for now. For those of you who've never experienced migraine yourself, you might now be thinking, gee, migraine sounds awful. I sure don't want to experience that. But chances are good that if you haven't already experienced a migraine by now, you may never have one. I'll now list the top risk factors. In other words, who gets them? Family history. It's often present, but not necessary in order to suffer from migraine. Being female is another risk factor. Women are three times more likely to experience migraine for this reason. Then there's age. A migraine can happen at any age, even in childhood, but tends to worsen between the ages of 30 and 40, then taper off after that. Notice that risk factors increase one's susceptibility to developing the condition. They are generally viewed as fixed factors rather than ones that can be easily changed. To compare, migraine triggers are the things that set off a migraine in people with the above risk factors. While some of them are actually hormonal, some are environmental factors, like diet. For example, dehydration can trigger a migraine because it's a stressor. When we don't drink enough water, our blood's fluid volume drops, 
leading to the stacking of blood platelets. With insufficient fluid intake, blood becomes thickened and acids build up, which is the perfect setup for the inflammation that occurs during a migraine attack. Then there's weather and climate. Have you ever noticed you get a migraine right before a storm starts? Scientists think that the rapid drop in atmospheric pressure that occurs with storms rolling in can elicit migraines in some susceptible people. So can extreme heat, humidity, or smog. Living in Ottawa, I can attest to the fact that our summer weather can be tropical at times. A change in season can bring on high exposure to environmental allergens, such as pollens and molds. In those who are allergic to these substances, histamine levels rise, and the associated symptoms of inflammation can trigger more frequent and more severe migraine attacks in migraineurs throughout the season. What about intense physical activity? Although moderate exercise is undisputedly good for us, extreme intensity or prolonged exertion is a form of stress on the body. There's also a risk of dehydration and the loss of electrolyte minerals. Speaking of stress, yes, it's another trigger for migraine. The reasons are complex, but likely associated with the biochemical changes that occur during a stress response. For example, have you ever noticed your breathing when under mental or emotional stress? You may hold your breath or breathe in a more shallow manner. This affects your blood and tissue oxygen levels, which affects pH levels, and so on. Together, these biochemical changes can set off a migraine attack. Then there are hormonal fluctuations that can trigger migraine, especially in females. This can start in puberty, when estrogen can spike during this rapid period of growth. The premenstrual migraine is something that many women have month after month, usually on a predictable day or days in those with regular menstrual cycles. Again, this is occurring when there are rapid changes in the blood levels of sex hormones, which fall before the menstrual period begins. But even women who are nearing the end of their reproductive years can experience a greater frequency or severity of migraine. Thankfully, this often subsides after menopause when the ovaries have retired from making estrogen and progesterone. When it comes to migraine, underlying food sensitivities have been linked to increased incidence. As a nutritionist, one of my roles is to help clients identify and avoid their food triggers for various conditions. But you don't have to have diagnosed food allergies to experience food triggers. For example, consumption of the flavor-enhancing food additive MSG, monosodium glutamate, and the artificial chemical sweetener aspartame have been found to trigger migraine attacks in some people. So can specific artificial colors or flavors. Eating a lot of aged foods and beverages can also be a trigger. I'm talking about wine, beer, kombucha, pickled foods, aged cheeses and cured meats, even overripe bananas and avocados. These last two are perhaps the most surprising offenders, the ones I often find in my nutrition clients' food journals. After all, they're natural, nutrient-dense foods, right? But all of these foods contain high levels of tyramine, a vasoactive amino acid that can trigger spasms in the blood vessels of the brain in susceptible people, triggering migraine. Another migraine trigger is nutritional deficiencies. Many observational and experimental studies have noted an association between vitamin and mineral deficiencies and higher migraine incidence, duration, and or severity. For example, it's been observed that iron deficient patients have higher frequency of migraine headache, especially in those who also have a diagnosis of depression or anxiety. So it's important that any migrainer get their ferritin levels tested to find out their iron status. Correcting this problem sometimes makes a huge difference in their well-being. Sometimes it's that simple. Another nutritional imbalance that is associated with migraine is magnesium deficiency. The vast majority of the population is not meeting their recommended daily intake of at least 450 milligrams daily. This isn't just due to food choices, but agricultural reasons. Soils just aren't being replenished with a full spectrum of minerals. Magnesium is essential to over 300 different chemical reactions, so if it's lacking, the body will complain. Magnesium deficiency lowers our pain tolerance, it causes muscle spasms and twitches, and it can raise our blood pressure. 
That's why we need to address any insufficiency. The good news is, many migraine triggers are certainly within our control. We can modify our behavior in order to reduce exposure to our triggers. Sometimes, this means reducing our intake of a certain type of food, or it may mean increasing our tolerance level for triggers by managing our stress, improving our diets, and taking nutritional supplements. Whenever possible, prevention is preferable to treatment. When it comes to lifestyle, not only does a preventative approach reduce your number of sick days, it improves your quality of life that extends beyond just being migraine-free. So, what are some of the things you can do to reduce your impact of migraine on your life? First, I'll outline the SEEDS approach to migraine prevention. SEEDS is an acronym that stands for sleep, exercise, eat, diary, and stress. S is for sleep. Maintaining a regular sleep schedule is important. That's because changes in our circadian rhythm, our sleep-wake cycle, can be a trigger for migraine. E is for exercise. Moderate movement alleviates stress. Remember, faster and more intense is counterproductive here. Start with increasing your frequency of physical activity and slowly increase duration and intensity, if appropriate for you. Remember to keep hydrated during exercise too. The other E is for eat. Eating regular meals, as opposed to skipping meals, seems to reduce chances of triggering an attack. That's pretty general advice, so I have some things to add to this section. Let's explore nutrition a bit more. Balanced eating means consuming meals and snacks that contain carbohydrates, protein, and fat, never just carbohydrates by themselves. For example, instead of just an apple, have some nuts alongside that. Doing this will help keep your blood sugar stable, reducing the risk of fluctuations that can trigger an attack. Carbohydrates need to be of high quality. Whole grains and root vegetables in place of sugar and flour. Instead of cookies or other desserts, fruit. Instead of jam infused yogurt, combine plain yogurt with fresh fruit. Make sure you avoid those aged and fermented foods if you're susceptible to migraine. Having wine and cheese in the same day could be enough to set off an attack. Don't be afraid of fats and oils. The most appropriate fats for migraine prevention are the monounsaturated and high-quality polyunsaturated fats because they keep blood flowing instead of coagulating excessively. Plus, they keep pain-inducing inflammation at bay. Choose olive oil and avocado oil for use in food preparation, always in dark glass bottles. Fish oil and flaxseed oil are rich sources of body-ready omega-3s, but these can go rancid easily once opened. Store them in the fridge or freezer to maximize freshness and use them within six weeks of opening. In essence, increase your intake of fresh, natural, and minimally processed foods. They provide a higher density of vitamins and minerals and a higher water content than foods with long ingredient lists of food additives. Aim for eight to 10 servings of fruit and vegetables daily. That's just four to five cups of loosely packed produce. Salads are the easiest way to accomplish this, but steaming vegetables is also good. Okay, now back to our seeds list. The D in seeds stands for diary. If you find your migraines unpredictable, start keeping a dated journal of the details of your days. Your journal notes should include not just what you ate, but who prepared it. For example, was it a restaurant or takeout meal? Or did you prepare it from scratch? If your migraines only occur after eating prepared food, a food additive may be your main trigger. Your diary should also include details like type and duration of exercise, fluid intake, sleep notes, as well as mood and stress level. Females should also include their menstrual cycle, since hormonal changes are often a trigger. There are apps out there to track these things quickly and easily. What you're aiming to do here is to create a set of data and look for patterns within it that will help you predict your migraines and take appropriate measures that could help you reduce migraine incidence, severity, and duration. The last letter in SEEDS stands for stress. That's stress management. Some stress is unavoidable, but learning healthy coping mechanisms can change our perception of stress. Alcohol will not be a good choice here for many reasons. Instead, 
consider practicing guided meditation, deep breathing and relaxation techniques. These improve oxygenation of the brain and increase the feel-good, relaxing neurotransmitters. Alternatively, you could do anything that makes you feel relaxed and happy. Take a bath, listen to music you like, or indulge in your favorite feel-good movie. So that's the SEEDS approach to migraine prevention, with a few extra bells and whistles that can really make a difference. To recap, the goals are to improve sleep, exercise, eat well, keep a diary, and reduce stress. Now let's talk about nutritional supplementation to support migraine. Today's farming practices and busy lifestyles means that diet alone rarely supplies consistent, absorbable amounts of micronutrients, like vitamins and minerals. That's why supplementation can be a really useful complement to any migrainer's daily routine. I'm going to outline the nutrients most influential to migraine. Then I'll talk about what Pure Lab offers in the way of nutritional support. The most essential supplement in migraine prevention is magnesium. There's strong evidence that magnesium deficiency is much more prevalent in migraine sufferers than in healthy individuals. Actually, 50 to 60% of migraine sufferers are deficient in this mineral. It's been used extensively in migraine prevention and in treatment, but why does it help? It all has to do with pain receptors on our neurons. If you watch Cyrus's natural pain management webinar, you learned all about this. But let me recap briefly for those who are new to the subject. Normally, calcium has to pass through the so-called NMDA receptor channel to trigger a nerve impulse, which is sensed as pain. But magnesium, when available, is able to sit there and disallow easy passage of the calcium. Without adequate magnesium, however, there is nothing to block the pain signal. Plus, the glycine portion of the magnesium glycinate molecule is able to dock onto the outside of the same receptor, also inhibiting the sensitivity of the pain receptor. The effect is less pain. Not only that, magnesium has a relaxing effect on muscles that control blood vessels. That is, it can decrease the risk of spasms caused by vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Our observations over the past 20 years mine as a clinical nutritionist and Cyrus's as a pharmacist, is that with proper dosing, about 60% of migraineurs who use Pure Lab's magnesium glycinate have become migraine free, while the other 40% at least improve. Our formula has had such a dramatic impact on those who take it that we see no reason to change it. That's why we've been using the same formula for our magnesium glycinate since 2002. Now, what else is special about Pure Lab's magnesium glycinate? You've probably seen a wide array of natural health products that contain magnesium, but they're not all equal in their health benefits. Reports of unwanted side effects like bloating, gas, and loose stool with the use of pure magnesium oxide supplements are common. This is because only a small amount of the magnesium of lesser quality is absorbed from the gut into the blood, and the unabsorbed portion is left in the bowel, whether you need it or not, causing loose stools. With this in mind, it becomes obvious that Pure Lab's magnesium glycinate is a better option. Each magnesium atom within magnesium glycinate is bound to two molecules of the amino acid L-glycine to aid its absorption. Our unique formulation combines a special ratio of reactive magnesium glycinate with a magnesium oxide glycine dry chelate blend. It's this combination of features that dramatically improves the absorption of our magnesium compared to straight magnesium oxide. So while other companies may use more magnesium oxide in their formulation to boast a higher dose capsule, their formulas are more likely to cause unwanted side effects. Why glycine? L-glycine is the smallest amino acid and quite essential to human health. It has a relaxing effect on the nervous system and it has anti-inflammatory properties too. It's also one of the three building blocks of glutathione making magnesium glycinate a great choice for supporting a variety of nervous system afflictions, including chronic pain. Our magnesium glycinate is also available as a powder. One rounded scoop or quarter teaspoon of our Pure Lab magnesium glycinate powder has 165 milligrams of magnesium, matching the dose available in one capsule. The powder is ideal for making nutritious blender drinks and is also free of any added sweeteners or flavors. How much magnesium should you take? Here are some dosing guidelines. As directed on our label of Pure Lab Magnesium Glycinate, 
we recommend taking three capsules per day. This is a maintenance dose, not a treatment dose. Instead, I'm talking about taking magnesium daily with the goal of reducing the incidence and severity of migraine occurrence in the first place. Now, some of you might have heard of the Magnesium Bowel Tolerance Protocol, which we developed with the pain clinic at CHEO years ago. This protocol should be considered when consulting with an ND or a nutritionist. Most NDs in Ottawa already have our protocol anyway. If not, they can contact us. These practitioners can follow your progress and take your whole health into consideration. They will also review your dietary intake and suggest modifications that reduce the risk of migraine. The second type of research-supported supplementation that's particularly beneficial for migraine management is B vitamins. For example, a systematic review and meta-analysis of multiple experimental and observational studies concluded that patients taking 400 milligrams of vitamin B2, that's riboflavin, daily for three months had significant improvement in migraine duration, frequency, and intensity. Another study used 80 milligrams of vitamin B6, pyridoxine, and found this daily dose reduced headache severity and duration. Note that these are therapeutic doses that cannot be obtained from a reasonable amount of food. And as our lives become more stressful and urgent, the B vitamins we do get from our food are quickly exhausted. We need them for energy, red blood cell and neurotransmitter production, and a myriad of other processes in the body that greatly influence how we feel. The problem with the B-complex vitamins is that because they're water-soluble, there's no way for the body to store them. They're absorbed and utilized where needed, with any extra getting dumped into the urine. In the end, you have to replenish these nutrients every couple of hours to get consistent blood levels. Typical supplementary B-complex formulations contain inactive forms of B vitamins that depend on a healthy, efficient liver to transform them into usable forms. Unfortunately, it is not a given that each individual will be able to accomplish this task due to differences in genetics and health status. That's why Pure Lab Vitamins Slow Release Bioactive B Complex was designed to be different. It's a slow release formula containing research supported ratios of B vitamins. It's designed to provide sustained benefits over a period of four to five hours, about three times as long as standard B complex formulations. You'll see your urine maintain a bright yellow hue much longer with our formulation compared to regular B complexes. As Cyrus likes to say, the proof is in the pea, not the pudding. Our slow release bioactive B complex features biologically active forms of B vitamins. Think of these activated vitamins like a fully charged battery ready to perform metabolic work instead of a partially empty one. The formula includes riboflavin 5 phosphate the biologically active form of vitamin B2 in a dose of 25 milligrams per capsule. Remember, this is a nutrient that has been shown to increase risk of migraine in those who aren't getting enough. Pure Lab slow release bioactive B6 can be used on top of our B complex for additional migraine support. It consists of biologically active B6 in a slow release capsule. Each dose contains 50 milligrams of pyridoxal 5 phosphate the biologically active form of vitamin B6. It's also a safer form of vitamin B6 to use at higher doses compared to pyridoxine hydrochloride, which is the form found in most B complexes and multivitamins. What you may notice when you're getting enough B6 is better dream recall, so watch for that. The next supplement I want to discuss is iron. For those whose migraines are occurring in part due to low iron levels, it's important to replenish iron in a way that doesn't create unpleasant side effects. The way to do that is to use an iron supplement with greater absorption. Pure Lab's Carbonyl Iron was designed with maximum absorption and better bowel tolerance in mind. The formulation contains 22.5 milligrams of elemental iron, a dose that is both well tolerated and well absorbed, helping you achieve your intake goals in a shorter time. With an absorption rate of 69%, this is as good as it gets when it comes to oral iron supplements. Your daily dose can probably be obtained from just one or two capsules. To enhance its solubility, our carbonyl iron also contains 100 milligrams of vitamin C per capsule. 
Just a reminder, supplement iron only if your blood test has determined that you need it. And if so, be sure to take it separately from high calcium containing foods and supplements. Remember, supplying enough of these nutrients to your tissues can not only reduce your dependence upon side effect inducing pain drugs, they may help them work better for you at lower doses. Be patient and be consistent with the changes you make. You may need to take these supplements for two or three months before you can expect to see major improvement in your migraine symptoms. Let me summarize what I've discussed. I've explained how migraine is more than just a really bad headache. I've outlined its risk factors and its triggers. I've also discussed migraine supportive lifestyle strategies focused on nutrition and the benefits of high quality targeted nutritional supplementation. I hope you've gained a better understanding of natural support for migraine from our perspective. At this time, I'd like to thank our sponsors that helped make this webinar possible. You can find Pure Labs products at all of these fine locations. Now I'm going to take a few moments to get ready to answer your questions. Please stand by. Thank you. So here we are. Alrighty, so we're back and I've got Cyrus here with me and we're ready to answer your questions about migraine nutritional support. So we're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, until the questions come, I might, might want to kind of recoup this whole 60% uh, resolution of migraines um, a bit in a bit more detail. I probably in the pharmacy, when I was still working in the pharmacy, treated, I would estimate, a couple of hundred migraine migraineurs and uh, explaining the ins and outs of therapeutic dosing of magnesium and B vitamins and uh, using the or explaining the, the way to treat um, migraines with magnesium in therapeutic dosing has helped in my experience approximately 60 percent after when i actually looked into the research uh, on migraine i found it very interesting that 50 to 60 percent of migraine sufferers actually were found to be magnesium deficient so that kind of really hit the the nail on the head there and uh, that was a very interesting uh, observation um, when i say resolution of migraines that's truly and really what i mean uh, those were people suffering from really debilitating um, types of migraines, sometimes even up to daily, uh, practically around the month uh, uh, suffering uh, symptoms, and they were able to practically walk away. You know? uh, this does, doesn't work for everybody, as indicated, 60% is uh, kind of the, the sweet spot there. The other 40% most often uh, suffered from migraines based on hormonal fluctuations or hormonal rhythms, but even they significantly improved uh, in regards to migraine severity and frequency. So there is in any case, from my point of view, a, an, an improvement to be expected. So yeah, and here we can, uh, here are the first questions coming in. Let's see what shows up. Well, uh, there is one question, any specific supplementation for the migraine and PMS? Well, kind of, Andrea covered that practically. Uh, for PMS, you would want to use magnesium at therapeutic dosing as well. As a muscle relaxant, you have significant impact here, reducing the cramping and reducing the pain levels. Um, I would not, from a PM, PMS point of view alone, you could start using magnesium just two, three days before onset of your menstrual cycle. But in order to really make a difference long term, I would always recommend to actually go through a replenishment cycle yeah. where you actually dose up higher to provide your daily requirements as well as sufficient um, magnesium to also then replenish the tissues so that they are full. And in that stage, you might not even need to use uh, extra magnesium premenstrual. That's right. I agree with that. Clinically, that's what I've seen too. And uh, I wanted to point out that it depends on your PMS symptoms too, right? So you could have hyperhydration in which you have, um, uh, you know, water retention around the middle, uh, in the breast that can be very painful, cause tenderness. B6 has actually got um, an interesting diuretic effect when you take it uh, enough of it. So that'll help drain some of that extracellular water that is causing some of your discomfort. So the B6, I think, is really important if you have the hyperhydration tenderness that goes with it. Okay, next question is from Kira, and she's asking, I hear if you take vitamin B, you can become deficient in another area. 
is, uh, is this a risk if you take a B complex or do I have it wrong? Um, I would say yes and no, Kira. <laughs> um, the reason why I designed our B complex based on uh, scientific ratios is, is exactly as follows. If you, for example, have one metabolic reaction that requires not just one but two B vitamins, uh, let's say B6 and B1, you know, and maybe a mineral, and you have lots of the B6 but not enough of the B1, the reaction will initially run very smoothly until no more B1 is, is present. And then even though you still have B6 and magnesium, this metabolic step stops because the third required nutrient is no longer there. So by um, kind of designing a B complex so that the Bs are contained in specific ratios to each other, you kind of try to maximize the efficacy of such a B complex. Um, if you were to use just a B complex and no magnesium uh, for a process that requires Bs and magnesium, the same thing happens. You get some benefits from the B complex, but you won't get the full benefit because the magnesium is missing and various metabolic pathways right. will not execute. Right. Simple and as that. That's where I like to remind people that no nutrient can do the job of another. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when, when you're looking at a couple of options to support yourself with migraine and or PMS, uh, then uh, you have to realize that you probably need more than one nutrient to get the most benefit, yeah. right? You need an array of nutrients to well, that, balance out the metabolic. There's balance. always an interesting observation I have when I have people on the phone uh, these days, mostly on the phone. In the olden days, I was in the pharmacy and readily available to everybody and then when I started talking about a B complex and then people would say yeah I take my B and I said what kind of B do you take yeah B12 uh, so B12 is just one of the nine most common Bs that's, right. that's not a B complex it's only one of the nine B vitamins and you might need B1 B2 B3 B5 B6 B9 yeah. or, or biotin uh, uh, at the same time in various concentrations mm -hmm. to truly let the engine hum, uh, hum along. No? That's right. Uh, here's an interesting question from Lisa. She says, are general physicians uh, uh, supportive of having blood work done uh, to check our iron, mineral and vitamin levels? Uh, generally, no. <laughs> Can I just make an appointment and get the lab requisition? That depends on the physician you're dealing with. Um, usually physicians have no problems with checking your ferritin levels, your iron levels. They are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. From my point of view, blood levels of minerals and B vitamins, other than B12, uh, are very uh, hard to get and also not very um, representative of your tissue situation, especially minerals. You can measure your, your magnesium plasma level or even your red blood cell magnesium level, which is the concentration of magnesium in circulation. But you have to keep one thing in mind. Our body is a closed vessel. And whenever a key nutrient is needed, uh, the tissues are uh, very quick to sacrifice their supplies to make sure that some of the key organs in our body, this one up here, this one here, and a couple of others, get what they need. Because you can imagine, if the muscle would just hold on to its magnesium, because it doesn't want to let it go, uh, it will only be a short uh, while until the heart stops beating and then the muscle has no benefits from that. So the tissues have various, uh, or their requirements have various priorities and the body organizes these very strictly. So muscle tissues in the, in the skeleton, in the body, have practically zero priority. They sacrifice whatever they have to make sure brain, heart, lungs and all the other key organs get their requirements to to make sure we don't die. You know? um, so testing minerals in blood other than iron is, is quite useless. I think that you can better go with symptoms and, and base, base your requirements on that. One other test that is, uh, from my point of view, valuable is hair mineral analysis. Uh, because we, we grow hair at an approximate speed of one centimeter per month. So if you take the first centimeter of hair from the skull, you practically measure a 30-day distribution of your mineral supplies because the hair follicle builds whatever is floating in circulation into the hair and you can really get conclusions about your average mineral supplies from the hair. And it's also not invasive and fairly cheap 
not covered by OHIP or any other health plan other than maybe private plans. And you can very easily also, after you detected specific deficiencies in your hair mineral analysis, address those issues and then two or three months later test again to see whether you are approaching optimal uh, hair mineral test levels. I hope that helps. Uh, yeah, doctors, physicians, um, some of them are cooperative, others uh, kind of they sent you, they sent you away. Um, it's tough these days. I believe that naturopathic doctors are much more cooperative uh, and oftentimes also more knowledgeable when it comes to nutrition. You know? uh, uh, Sujata, Sujata is asking, uh, how high of the dosage? Well, it's nutrient. Well, I, was, sure. I assume you're talking about magnesium. Andrea mentioned the so-called magnesium bowel tolerance protocol, which we developed with the Chio Pain Clinic, uh, meanwhile, 20 years ago. Um, it's a protocol where you titrate the dose up. Every day you take one capsule more until you reach your bowel's tolerance level, which shows itself by developing watery, loose bowel movements. So it's practically your bowel waving the white flag yeah. saying I can't take this anymore and you're flushing out at that point you don't stop taking magnesium you simply cut back by one quarter of your peak dose further replenishing the tissues and then at some point even on the reduced dose you will again hit your bowel tolerance because your body is filling up and then you dose down again by a quarter and at some point you're ending up somewhere around the maintenance dose of two to four cups a day but you're then coasting on a full body, on a replenished body, and that makes all the difference. I hope that answers that. The difference between a stroke versus migraine given loss of vision. Well, uh, because the symptoms are so, well, they, they're individual, right? Yes. Um, each person will experience it differently. But if you've never experienced this visual disturbance before, it's probably... I have a first-hand <laughs> description here. I actually, I, had, I never had migraines. I had tension headaches as a teenager. Um, I believe stress and diet related. Uh, at, uh, I think about the age of 45, I had my first um, visual migraine. Or, Aura. No, just a visual migraine. Okay. I had no pain or headache. Simply, I had all these flashes moving through my field of vision. And I also, in this, uh, in this first episode, developed word-finding difficulties, which is like a prime symptom of a stroke. You know? I was at work in the dispensary, and I told my colleague, hey, you better call the ambulance. I'm having a stroke here you know, at 45, pro possible. But anyways, after this first initial experience, uh, I realized that the symptoms I was experiencing are very um, like clearly identifiable and um, after you had this uh, for the first time you will always kind of remember oh yeah this is here's an optical migraine ha happening I'm starting to see flashes in the in the right, right field of my vision it's slowly moving through my field of vision right. that's typical and it's I'm, I'm no longer uh, concerned uh, concerned about right. having a stroke but right? would you agree that say if someone's never had these symptoms before First they time, do what absolutely. you did which absolutely. is uh, call 911 or exactly. go to the hospital present yourself yes. to the emergency room just to get checked out to make sure it is not a TIA yeah. or a stroke or something yes. right yeah but I think you'll learn to distinguish that very quickly and yeah, there, because there's always also other tiny little symptoms that uh, are, are small but distinguish or just um, discernible. No? Uh, Lisa is asking, I was uh, surprised to reason to learn that K2 is very important to take with vitamin D. Never had this been communicated to me. Well, this is not a migraine question, but still a good question. Um, I, th I always, just to kind of quickly answer that, um, I believe that uh, vitamin K2, especially K2 and K7 and vitamin D3 are like co-workers. They both handle calcium in the system. Uh, I always call K2 MK7 the stonemason's assistant. He's the guy carrying the cement to the wall being built. And vitamin D3 is the stonemason putting the cement calcium into the bone and into the tissues where it's needed. Um, they should be taken or if, if calcium metabolism is an issue, uh, combination of K2 MK7 and D3 
is definitely uh, indicated. I believe that fixed combination products that combine, for example, a thousand IUs with uh, around 100 micrograms of K2 are not to be used because you have we have individual requirements for D3. Some people get good levels on 2000 IUs per day. Others need to take five or 10,000 to get anywhere close to mid reference range. If you were to use a fixed combination product, you might get way too much K2. Uh, while that is not dangerous, it's most certainly a waste. You know? So we keep K2, MK7 and D3 separate so that you maintain therapeutic flexibility. Yes. That's how I call that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see that. Oh, I, I understand. So uh, the question about uh, migraines and PMS. Um, uh, the, uh, the Su Sujata meant that she actually experiences migraines specifically before a period. Right. Well, I, I mentioned the importance of the magnesium taken preventively through the month and perhaps dosing up beforehand if mm -hmm. you find that is not sufficient to uh, reduce the, the episode from happening in the first place. But then there's the B6 as well, right? Yes. And then there's the B2. Uh, really, <laughs> all of them. I, I think and all of them another big thing. work together. Yeah, and I've worked in this field for about 20 years as a compounding pharmacist. Um, assuming that you're at an age where potentially hormonal fluctuations are starting to happen, um, there might be a disbalance on the hormonal side. And uh, we learned that about 40% of migraineurs, of female migraineurs, uh, experience migraines with a very close connection to, this, uh, to the menstrual cycle. Right. So then it's really important also next to the replenishment of magnesium, as well as to the provi provision of B vitamins, to get a closer look on what's happening within your hormonal cycle, right. which is done through either blood work or salivary testing, mm -hmm. saliva. Um, this is very important because you might be able, with, by tweaking uh, the incoming amounts of often just one of the three or four sex hormones in a female body, progesterone, taken at a certain time of the cycle, you might completely eradicate the occurrence of, um, of migraines altogether. Mm -hmm. Problem is physicians. <laughs> Problem is to find a physician today mm -hmm. that actually does hormone replacement therapy. Uh, I believe in Ontario, um, naturopathic doctors have limited prescribing rights. They can also test mm -hmm. salivary or blood uh, levels of, um, of sex hormones, progesterone, estrogens, there's three of the estrogens, and also testosterone, and then kind of draw the picture of what's actually going on within the, the menstrual cycle of the person that experiences not just PMS, but also migraines at a specific time of the cycle. And then you can use hormone replacement therapy, which is where we normally use uh, one or two or three of the affected hormones in cream form on the skin, absorbed through the skin, um, to, to tweak your personal levels into a more optimum range. And with that, you achieve oftentimes very good results. Problem is, you've got to find a physician uh, that does that. Um, one way of finding out about who does HRT in your city is to actually go to the best compounding pharmacy in your town and ask the pharmacist who here is the best hormone prescriber. No? And then you get a name because they get the prescriptions from the, the practice, from the clinic, whether it's a medical doctor or a naturopathic doctor. And then you can make an appointment and get assessed. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's uh, for anybody who suspects that there is a clear, uh, um, uh, that the, the, the migraines are coming on in a very clear defined cycle, that's definitely a, a strong recommendation. Yeah. May I comment on the next uh, question sure. I saw there, which is, should we add anything else if migraines are triggered by EMFs? That's electromagnetic frequencies. Mm -hmm. So it's true. I've noticed I've had clients in the past <coughs> who are very sensitive to electromagnetic radiation. And while I've never seen a, a client that had a direct impact from uh, like a migraine triggered by EMF, um, it can cause a lot of uh, discomfort, right, and fatigue and generalized just um, 
MLAs. And so while I don't know exactly an item or a substance that can be taken that would uh, you know, do the work of, of what you're looking for, for EMFs, I'd consider if these nutrients are not doing enough after three months of use in therapeutic doses, the magnesium, the B complex with extra B6 and B2, preferably in the biologically active form, your iron has been checked and uh, you know improved if necessary. If that isn't cutting it, then lifestyle measures limiting your exposure. And also there are some botanicals that could be be used, right? We have feverfew, uh, which is uh, also known as grand chamomile. Uh, it's a plant that has a unique property of controlling those cerebrovascular spasms in the head, uh, which of course involve that vasoconstriction and vasodilation I was talking about. So helping minimize those spasms and used preventively regularly every day at the same time, like clockwork, um, that has been shown to be very beneficial. Just make that sure that if you haven't tried feverfew, that it's a standardized extract, mm -hmm. and it's about 0.2 to 0.4 percent of the active ingredient, and that would be the parthenolides. So check carefully on labels for that. You'll get a more consistent result when you use something standardized. One other thing to consider is obviously you will not be able to uh, alter the presence of Wi-Fi uh, <laughs> uh, in your at your workplace, uh, in public, or anywhere. But you could certainly at home reduce the exposure by not using Wi-Fi, but uh, Ethernet network instead. Mm -hmm. True. Um, if you're living in, a, in a, an apartment building with like seven or 10 or 25 mm. uh, routers around you, there is no, no avoiding that. You would pra practically have to move yeah. out. I have a couple of uh, interesting clients, uh, actually an old couple in, in British Columbia that uh, moved into a beautiful area in the Okanagan and then found out that they were extremely or the husband was extremely sensitive towards um, electromagnetic waves and they even went so far to tell the BC Hydro to not install a digital Wi-Fi electrical meter you know, which meanwhile everybody has because they also emit uh, radiation Wi-Fi and when BC Hydro did not comply with that request to use an old school uh, regular meter, they simply made the decision to not have hydro. You know? So they live in this, uh, wow, that's <laughs> in this development yeah. and their house practically is off grid. You know? That's it's, an extreme it's measure. Dra it's drastic. You know? But they're happy. But that's... <laughs> That's what to get. More realistically, there are also um, suppliers of uh, EMF blocking blankets. Uh, of course, different things to block uh, EMF from phones as well. Yeah. And I, I mean, the blankets, you, unless you wear it to work, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. But at home, during the night, things like that, uh, there are different uh, you know, materials that can be used uh, to minimize your exposure. And that's, that's where it's at, I think, is about minimizing. We won't be able to avoid it entirely, okay. unfortunately. Okay, Emily is asking, uh, if, you're, if someone is in the middle of a migraine cycle, is there anything they can take and in that moment? Now, that's tricky, uh, but there's certainly some you can try. Um, I mean, the, the triptan nasal sprays or injections are very fast acting and can sometimes help, even though many patients do not like the side effects from these drugs. They make them uh, complete woozy and foggy. And, mm. and uh, like so I have uh, patients or had patients that rather suffered through a migraine attack than using a triptan drug. I think you can certainly try to use two caps of magnesium in, like whenever you get your hands on them. You can repeat that every hour if you can tolerate that. And that leads directly into the next question here by Brenda. Uh, do you have any recommendations for people who get diarrhea from your magnesium glycinate? And I do, uh, obviously. There's two things I would like to, to say to that. If if you're dealing with migraines and you cannot tolerate a, even my good quality kind of magnesium glycinate uh, and you uh, develop loose stools or even diarrhea from just one or two capsules, this is a very strong indication that your gastrointestinal tract is in a chronically inflamed state. Mm. There is no doubt in my mind that your body actually needs the magnesium, but your bowel cannot tolerate even small amounts uh, without flushing right away. Um, I think that needs to be looked at. Mm. There is a variety of tests, symptomatic as well as blood tests that can be done to see whether you suffer from a variety of potential 
food sensitivities, which would put your bowel into a chronically inflamed state. Think about when you have a, uh, your, your nasal mucous membrane when you have a cold. That membrane is inflamed and it's shedding mucus. It's chronically swollen. Yeah. There's a lot of blood circulation happening there. The same tube goes all the way down mm -hmm. and is practically a similar kind of mucous membrane. And if you are dealing with a pre so far not diagnosed food sensitivity, you can imagine that the mucous membrane lining of your bowels is just as swollen, shedding mucus and inflamed yeah. as your nose when you have a cold. Right? Right. And this system is very sensitive and reactive and that needs to be addressed and, and, and inflammation needs right. to be reduced so that you can then actually properly absorb the magnesium and then yeah. you will see the benefits in regards to your migraines. That's a really good point. I think we have to avoid blaming the uh, the straw that broke the camel's back. You know, the very last thing that came in is often the thing we accuse of causing the problem when really it just it's the thing that causes the barrel to runneth over. So looking after the runneth? underlying over. Yes, <laughs> runneth is a Shakespearean uh, term. <laughs> right. And I have another tip. Um, and that regard is, is uh, it has I've used this many times in so-called IBS patients. Personally, I find the label IBS or irritable bowel syndrome to be a very lazy medical label. You go to your doctor, you say, oh, I suffer from fluctu fluctuating di diarrhea and constipation. Uh, my bowel is very irritable. Flop, you get the label, you have IBS and they send you home and don't give you any kind of choice. From my point of view, there's always a reason why your bowel is irritable and it's most often and most likely an underlying food sensitivity that's that you consume something and it could be as benign as a cucumber that your system decided to find it needs to react to and then you have this chronic inflammation with ibs patients i've recommended this many 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 times and it has worked pretty much not always but often you take the capsule or you buy the powder, magnesium glycinate powder, and you, you have a large bottle of water, a water bottle, and you fill it up in the morning and you put initially one scoop of magnesium glycinate or one capsule into this bottle. And then you start sipping this water over the course of the day, which means every sip from the bottle is just a very small amount of magnesium glycinate that will hopefully not trigger um, loose bowels. No? So you actually have a chance to absorb these very small increments over, over the course of the day. And you do that for a day or two, and then you mm -hmm. take two scoops and right. put them in the bottle and keep doing it the same right. way. As long as you finish the bottle, you've consumed first one, later two capsules without experiencing this reactiveness from your bowels. No? That's and right. And then you're slowly benefiting from that. And finally, sorry, <laughs> I always have more to say. Uh, what I observed with patients like that is that once they actually benefited from these very small increments on the first few days, it was almost like they, they broke through the sound barrier because all of a sudden they were able to tolerate much higher doses per day without the bowels being reactive. Because once you get the magnesium into the blood, then also the bowels will get more magnesium from the blood side. Yeah. And they can kind of function, start functioning better. There's more peristalsis happening, more activity, more blood circulation, maybe even. And with that, this chronic inflammatory state goes down a little bit. But the, if there is a food sensitivity underlying, magnesium alone will not, not fix that. We need to investigate and then change diet for some time to, to mm -hmm. fix the inflammation. I was simply going to add to you an analogy to what you were saying yeah. about using the small doses and how that is less likely to cause um, any uh, side effects like the loose stool. I think of it like the gentle rain, a soaker hose in your garden, right? You know that the garden soil will absorb the moisture um, more readily than a downpour when it all goes running off, right? You, you've seen that happen before. The rain just runs right off and it doesn't soak in. Yeah. So that's because you've used a high dose, right? It's too much. So so using that small dose is, is going to be more uh, effective and less likely to cause those side effects. Cool. Here's a question from Anonymous. He's, he or she says, great webinar. How do you know uh, from blood work if you need B-complex or not? Um, 
Blood tests uh, only include B12. There is a test where you can actually measure that. What about homocysteine checking, though? Well, yeah, you can then test for certain things yeah. where you know that B vitamins in, are involved in, in the metabolism of the blood marker. And then yeah. if the blood marker is high, yeah. you know you need B12, B6, B, B3. But that's more complex testing and no right. physician that I know uh, mm. is executing that properly. You Maybe have to ask. Pass. You yes. need to ask them for a homocysteine test and you'll pay for it. I don't think it's covered by OHIP. Yeah, but um, then they wouldn't even make the connection to a B vitamin. They just say, hey, your homocysteine is too high. They, Actually, I think there's substantial literature out there that I hope that they have that seen. you can read. But the physician, <laughs> uh, I don't know. We'll, some physicians. If you get I, a good one, yeah. I but. once had a, a, a client tell me that their cardiologist, uh, upon telling them that they were seeing a nutritionist who asked them to be checked, have their homocysteine levels checked, that he, the cardiologist was impressed that the nutritionist knew enough to, to ask that. Mm -hmm. So I took that as a compliment, not an insult, and uh, sure. yeah, so. But I mean, homocysteine also <laughs> then would, rec would refer to B12. Right. Which you can also test directly in plasma. Yes, you right? can. You but can. you can't test the others or not efficiently. Right, so just then, to, can we just clarify for those who don't know, uh, homocysteine, it's something you don't want to become elevated in your blood because yeah. that is a risk factor for heart attack and stroke, okay? Yeah. And the nutrients that keep homocysteine from uh, rising are B2, B6, folic acid, and B12, B12. As long, along with uh, methionine, right? Yeah, methionine, betaine. Yeah. Yeah. But that's practically a B complex. Right. right. There. So there it is. So you might as well take it. Yeah. <laughs> and then one other thing to a B complex B vitamins are water soluble. They flush through us. That means they do not build up, they do not become toxic. There's only one B that has uh, a research based, uh, an intrinsic risk yeah. that you could overdose, and that's B6. But in order to, be, to, take, to reach toxic levels of B6, you would have to use a My B complex at 10 caps a day ongoing for at least two, three, four weeks, which is no mega overdose, you will yeah. never get to that. Yeah. So from my point of view, with the state of our diet today, um, with what we kind of get from, from vegetables and crops uh, from diet alone, there is no reason not to use a B-complex, period. Right. Uh, maybe just one little connection, because I always like to throw these little images in. If we agree that our soils are mineral deficient, that has another consequences, consequence for the crops we grow on these soils as well. Because a plant doesn't just have B vitamins in it, no. it has to make them. It uses enzymes in a variety of metabolic pathways to build B1 or B6 or B9 or B12. If this plant grows on soils that, do, doesn't, that, that doesn't provide the minerals that the plant needs to make B6, then the plant will not make B6. Even though if you read up that this crop is usually high in B6, if that crop that you eat today grew on a mineral deficient soil, uh, uh, it, it won't have any B6 in it. So it's false information and false belief that you can get adequate or therapeutic levels of nutrients from diet. Mm -hmm. Even if you look at, um, <laughs> Like which, which crops contain high potassium, for example. You always get the recommendation, drink orange juice or eat a banana. Huh? And that used to be true maybe in the 1950s. But today we grow bananas in monocultures in countries that do nothing but producing bananas. Mm -hmm. So the soils of these banana monocultures has not a speck of potassium left in it. Rain doesn't bring it back onto the soil. And if the farmer isn't buying a multi-mineral or a specific potassium fertilizer and puts that back onto the soil, there is no potassium in those bananas. Even though the literature yeah. says banana is Our a good, good source, source of potassium. Huh? Yeah. I hope that makes sense to exactly. you. Exactly. To me it does. And it's, it's, so it's regional too, right? Yeah, How can totally. we say that bananas are high in potassium when they're grown in so many different countries and different soils, whatever? So, agreed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting question from Christina. Yeah. She asks if L-theanine is also good to support migraine. And I think there's potential there because if your migraines are brought on by stress, right? We talk, I mentioned that stress is one of the things in the seeds list of uh, things to deal with uh, to reduce your risk. Um, then L-theanine 
training, because it raises alpha brain waves and because it promotes relaxation and without sedation, it could be a safe and uh, you know possibly effective option. Absolutely. Have you seen any literature on that? Any research? Well, there's tons of literature and research on, on stress migraine? reduction and on stress. stress as the, yeah. one of the five triggers of migraines. If you can manage your stress better mm -hmm. with the help of a theanine, so go for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have nothing to lose, really. No. The great thing about it and why we sell it is because it's compatible with most medications. Yeah, and with all medications. Basically, There's no contraindication with any prescription drug. Right. And so whether you're taking an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication and you're looking for a little more help there, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's a great option because it doesn't it's cause that sedation. You can still drive. Uh, it doesn't uh, it helps you focus. So it doesn't compromise your, your productivity at work yeah. and so on. So I think it's a great option. Let us know uh, if you try it and uh, whether it helps you yeah. there. Email Thanks. info at purelabvitamins.com. Mm -hmm. You can also leave uh, feedback on our website. There is a testimonial section where you can just click and then actually write a testimonial, good or bad. That's right. Uh, Sujata, I, I really would like to help you. She's, uh, she's asking again about this case with migraines and PMS. And she's asking um, some clients experience uh, period diarrhea along with migraine. And I think that um, Obviously, you cannot use therapeutic doses of magnesium if you truly cannot retain any of it and you have loose bowel movements, watery bowel movements, and you're actually losing minerals with the diarrhea as well. <coughs> but that would call for a replenishment um, for the, during the rest of the month. Use more elevated amounts of magnesium um, like post-period uh, post, uh, for 10, 15, 20 days so that your tissues actually are replenished yeah. or more replenished by the time the next period comes around. And I would urge you to then actually start uh, doing a, 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 a migraine PMS diary and write down what your normal kind of cycle looks like. And then with the introduction of more therapeutic doses of magnesium throughout the rest of the month, how then you slowly, month over month over month, hopefully improve and I'm pretty sure you will huh? so yeah bowel tolerance means to the point where your bowels reaches its tolerance not beyond you shouldn't be suffering yeah. from uh, watery diarrhea for the whole month you know you have to titrate to that point then cut back a little bit continue at a fa fairly high dose until you reach again bowel tolerance dose down again and then find your maintenance dose and coast with that Janet asks, is there a time of day that vitamin uh, B vitamins are best to be taken? And we believe that taking them in the morning or noon or both uh, is best because sometimes the B vitamins can be a little bit stimulating because they do support energy production mm -hmm. in the body. So if you have an issue with like falling asleep easily or things like that, we recommend taking them earlier in the day. And plus you'll obtain more benefits in your day than uh, you'll notice at night in the sense that uh, you probably will need that extra energy support so yeah breakfast and then another dose at lunch perhaps uh, that should be uh, sufficient yep. uh, in terms of our B complex yes so uh, Renee says thank you very good information thank you Renee uh, we're coming closer to the end here um, anonymous is asking how long does it take to notice a difference in taking magnesium glycinate mm -hmm. for some people some people one day they already notice a difference the next day that uh, pain levels are dropping, that muscles are looser, they sleep better. Um, uh, restless leg patients, for example, mm -hmm. I hear it mostly from the spouses. They said, oh my God, mm -hmm. he didn't kick me last night or she didn't kick me last right. night. Yes. So I think somebody who is deficient and um, we know that a very high percentage of the population is, we know we learned about magnesium sufferers, that they, about 60% of them are deficient. Uh, in the general population, there are studies talking about 80% of the North American population actually being deficient. So you can imagine if you put a specific kind of fuel into a tank that was previously empty, all of a sudden the engine starts running. So for some people, results can be felt yeah, very within, dramatic. within very short time. That's Others right. need a little bit longer. And then here's the last question. Oh, there's more coming. Um, is there a certain time to start dosage at night for magnesium glycinate? 
uh, I always say when it comes to sleep patterns, um, if you have troubles falling asleep, you should take the magnesium bedtime dose about an hour before your lights go out. Yeah. If you normally go to sleep at 11, you would take the magnesium glycinate two or three capsules an hour before. And that, that's because then your blood levels are fully there by the time you actually switch off and you can relax and go to sleep. For somebody who has trouble staying asleep, I would take it as, as late as possible, practically with the magnesium right at your night table and then take it. That's right. If sleep is an issue, you would want to maybe consider using slow release L-theanine at the same time and in equal form. If you have troubles falling asleep, you take your two capsules of magnesium glycinate and your one or two caps of L-theanine slow release an hour before lights out. If you have trouble staying asleep, you take both right at lights out. Uh, but then you start titrating up if you wanted to do this replenishment uh, protocol. That means the next day you take one in the morning, two at night. The day after you take one in the morning, one at lunch, two at night. And then you take two, one, one, two. Then two, two, two. Then two, two, three. Then three, two, three. And so forth until you reach your bowel tolerance. And let me give you a bit of an insight here. The average chronic pain patient can tolerate 12 to 16 capsules per day before they get too loose. No? And that shows you that these bodies are sucking it up like a sponge no? before then at some point more of the dose affects the bowel, triggering loose stools. No? That's, uh, it, it's very common. There's a medication question for you. Uh, Terry is asking whether magnesium can interfere with any medication. There's a few. Uh, birth control. Because if you reach bowel tolerance and get loose, you might not absorb your birth control pill properly and you're, ex <laughs> you're experiencing the risk of uh, unwanted pregnancy. Um, most cardio um, uh, medications, uh, especially blood pressure medication, benefit from magnesium because you're actually relaxing the muscles surrounding the blood vessels, which means the lumen of the blood vessels goes up, which means if the pipe goes bigger, the pressure goes down. You, know? you might have to adjust blood pre pressure medication yeah. if previously you were deficient and you had at least a portion of your high blood pressure due to the magnesium deficiency. There's a couple of antibiotics that do not go well with bivalent minerals. Uh, that's mostly the um, here, pharmacy is so long ago for me. Uh, the quinolones uh, like um, ciprofloxacin and uh, ciprofloxacine, um, Zithromax, and t -t -t -t, uh, Levofloxacin, the floxoxacins, uh, they don't go well with magnesium as well. And that's practically it. You can also very easily Google mm -hmm. magnesium drug interactions and you get the full list. Mm -hmm. uh, to my knowledge, there's not a single migraine medication that interferes with magnesium or vice, mm -hmm. vice versa. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, well, that was it. Uh, there's no more questions here. Uh, I hope this was of value to you. I think Andrea did an amazing job Thank with you. the presentation. Um, you can always also send questions to info at purelabvitamins.com. Or Andrea at purelabvitamins.com if you have nutrition-related questions. Yes. yes. And uh, you can leave feedback on our website or at info at purelabvitamins.com. And there's now a slew of people saying thank you. Uh, Kira says this was very informative. Thank you. Thank Super. you, Kira, for being here. And uh, oh, I think we'll send you guys into your evening, hopefully not too smoky out there. Um, actually, I still have a good number of people here. I wanted to point out one other thing close to my heart, and that's a political thing. We're currently facing changes in the politics surrounding uh, supplements and the potential availability of supplements for Canadian people. The government is trying to pass a bill, C-47, um, which I believe will have a huge impact on uh, at least the pricing of supplements uh, moving forward, but potentially also a, a huge impact on... Um, availability? Well, not necessarily availability, but therapeutic usage of supplements. Uh, I, I dare to say that if this bill passes, not maybe right away, but a, an event like this, where I 
and Andrea stand here talking about the value and the application of supplements and nutrients might become a thing of the past. So I would uh, encourage you to read up on Bill C-47. And if you, and there's all kinds of things in, in circulation already, good and bad videos. Uh, some are really doomsday, others are more, um, more, more level-headed. But I believe that on the whole, uh, this proposed bill is going to become a problem for Canadians, uh, short to, to mid-term. And if that is of interest, if you develop an opinion in this field, then talk to your MP and express your discontent with, <laughs> with this kind of policy. Uh, I, my MP got my discontent already. Um, okay, I think... Uh, We'll take it to an end here. Have a nice evening. Thank you all for joining and, and for your interest. See you next time, hopefully, if the bill doesn't prevent us from providing this kind of information. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.